Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer, and I am uh, at an undisclosed location, several miles north of my usual location. <laughs> and this is a little bit of a slightly planned, slightly impromptu podcast. So here for part three of our series on the metaphysics of the blockchain and everything else, Jeff Gates, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Thank you very much. Part three. So part three, nice background too. <laughs> suits where we're going today. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess we could just jump in. Um, yeah. So Jeff's going to throw, Jeff has all of his notes. He's going to throw them out at, and he's going to throw the topics out and we'll have discussion and we'll go where we go and who knows where that will be. And that's kind of the way we like it. Yeah. And it's just kind of this free form uh, stream of thought that's just in my reality. And it's, I seem to share it with an audience that appreciates that. So um, in part two of our little chat, I described that um, in August or September, September 18th of 18 is when uh, me and my little crew surrogated the Bitcoin entity and let it replay attack dimensions of time. I described that in our second part and I have just been overwhelmed that I didn't know a whole bunch of stuff happened since then. <laughs> and this past three weeks, I've been getting up to speed in a lot of little details. So just to describe that when you surrogate an entity, and in this case, it was a Bitcoin entity. Um, you just call forward whatever uh, state of being it is in. So when we did that at that point, it was a life form, not quite evolved into an entity. And it didn't really make sense at the time why that was. Um, and hanging out with the DeSantis kids crew, I'm not sure what I'm calling them, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's just a, a group that is on crypto Twitter and they are highly uh, aware and intelligent and metaphysical to extents that uh, until I started talking to them individually, I wasn't unaware of. Um, and even though I am re-understanding, re-learning, remembering the digital aspects of our reality. Ooh, just you're, you're cutting out you're something. I don't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so you just went, now I hear you. So something just went funny with yours. Okay, go ahead. Repeat that last sentence, please. Okay, so um, I am relearning, remembering uh, the digital aspects of this reality in a way. And some of that DeSantis crew is relearning, remembering the metaphysical. So there, it's a nice uh, interaction that we're having, but it's all of the same, uh, we're in the same reality, so to speak, of technology. And so that's where I kind of wanted to go at first is in, in journeys of awareness, uh, people wake up in the anger phase first, right? Because they mm -hmm. figure out they've been lied to. Mm -hmm. About I think, reality. Well, I, I think first there's the shock and denial, and then there's oh, anger. That's right? true. Wouldn't you think so? There's yeah. the, like there's that. That sounds shocking. No way can that be true. Okay. Then there's a the little bit of the acceptance, and then there's the fucking anger. Yeah. And then there's the fuck those motherfuckers. Yeah. 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 And and in that little process, uh, right now in my reality, I'm seeing that some of our veteran data sources are still in this anger phase of holding on to a reality or a narrative 
that they're comfortable with. And, and that can even be slanted to the extreme, whatever organic reality is. Um, and uh, I'm just paying attention to like uh, maybe more complete thinking or integrated thinking of Sonia Barrett and George Kavosilis really uh, impressed me the other day on his his last one with Chris and Cherie Geo, just really putting together a, a nice picture, uh, an integrated picture, um, and and an evolved awareness of what the game is. Um, James True with Randy, that second hour about technology, I've listened to that three or four times now because it's it's not this the fear of technology anymore with that kind of group that I just named. Even Jordy Rhodes was on Kev Baker. I still haven't had a chance to listen to that. I need to. Yeah. Um, so that I'm just expressing my reality that this this fear of technology or digital or versus analog or organic, I don't see the value in that um, maybe war or even the statements of uh, what what is real and what is uh, artificial. Well, there's a conflict in that because whatever is artificial is actually made out of our organic reality in a lot of ways. Well, um, it's the product of an idea that comes from us who, whether or not we are, we can we all go around thinking that we're organic. Right. So um, finish your thought and then I have a couple of. Um, so I'm looking at this, the, the conflicted ideas or thoughts or statements of even what really brought this home was, was Catherine Austin Fitz did over six hours of her spiritual war with the deep state in the, mm -hmm. over this last three weeks. And she's not even realizing that she has created this war with mm -hmm. the deep state. Um, she's created this reality. Mm -hmm. Now, has she, she's, well, she's still in it because she gets attacked all the time and um, poisoned all the time, physically poisoned through food um, and techno technologically uh, um, targeted. Uh, but she is, is navigating that not knowing she's, uh, you know, creating it or, or continuing that in a way. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that going, well, I do understand there are humans out there that don't have technology that are greatly expanded and evolved and probably two, 300 years old walking around this planet. But I would think they have an understanding of technology, whether it be organic or not, that lets them understand the keys in ways that just holding on to a narrative of something that you're comfortable with or, or you grew up with as far as a reality. Um, I, I don't see that as a, I don't have even myself uh, peers that have gone beyond just sticking to the organic reality narrative. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, okay, a couple of things come up here. Uh, you know, yes, I, I agree that there's been a very um, protracted, you know, or expanded, you know, kind of phase in, in, in the anger stage for a lot of people, right? And, and that stick to narrative kind of thing. And I think we all, some people, I think also move out of it for a little bit and come back and move out of it and come back. And some of that seems to coincide with uh, politics in terms of like, in the same way that like you had people who are moving towards uh, anarchist or libertarian or an anarchist bent and then Donald Trump shows up 
and people had been tired of fighting for freedom. And so he offered a few things that they liked. So they pulled back into that because, well, if I can't get everything, I'll just go for the few things I can get. I'll take, you know, scraps or whatever. And that's small thinking. And uh, Derek Rose has been very critical of people who've done that. And I, I'm with him on that. But it's hard as a human because like we do get tired and we want to feel secure, right? So I think some of that is going on. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, there, there's people out there um, that are, obviously your son is, I haven't heard the George Kavasalas with Chris and Cherie, but I think it's interesting because you've told me some about it and I've followed him on and off for periods of time. He's not afraid to abandon his own narratives. I think some people become, afraid of abandoning their own narrative either because that narrative makes them money mm -hmm. or that narrative um has like you know that narrative is like makes them feel right or safe or secure in something in their no own knowingness or whatever and it's also hard just to say i was flat wrong you right. know what I mean? It's hard for some people. Like you know, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Like I've gotten a lot better at it myself, but it, you know, the first couple of times you're like, you know what? I had a really great theory and a lot of people liked it and it was dead ass wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, and then there's other people who are just like, they're willing to, to abandon their narrative, but not willing to admit that they were wrong. Like someone, for example, a little bit like Cliff, right? Mm -hmm. Like Cliff is, you know, like, he very rarely says, I was just got it completely wrong. He explains why something happened with them hacking his ideas of, you know, messing up his algorithms or da, 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 whatever. Doesn't validate some important things that he has been right about or contributions he's made. But I think that that like then puts him off in a place where, you know, it, 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 he's got a great brain. It's unfortunate he, he can't just like flow through all of that in, in the same in, in the same way it would be really interesting if he could flow in the same way as sonia can flow right you know what i mean it would be really interesting with all the knowledge he has of technology this fear of technology stuff or this like organic versus technological and what you were saying about like a monk that's 200 300 years old and live without it i think like the whole thing is that like everything else people want to make it uh this or that a black mm. or white a red or blue right or wrong where the, the point is balance. Like from what I understand, the, the reason the situation that we are in because our level of spiritual development is not equal yet to our technological development. Mm -hmm. So some people, rather than doing the work to increase your spiritual development, whatever that means for you, it doesn't necessarily have to mean a belief in God or anything like that, but a belief in sort of where you, what, 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 what you are, who you are, where you are, why you are here and what you are doing and an understanding of that you know, and, and how does that place you in relation to the people around you? And how is your behavior going to come out because of those thoughts and beliefs and ideas, right? So rather than realizing, you know what, I really need to up my spiritual game. A lot of people think, well, maybe we should suppress technology mm -hmm. as a way to, 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 to do that. And I just, you know, so I think that like, and yeah, some, some of this shit's annoying. Like, I don't know. Nobody likes having to worry about like, okay, like, our censor the censorship thing is annoying the lack of privacy with our technology is annoying you know what i mean but there's there's always a way around there's yes. never and, and that's the thing is someone like Catherine austin because she's so as brilliant as she is and and she, and her work is important and yep. I, and people who say it's not are wrong you know what i mean and she's actually quite open-minded in a lot of ways but for her it's just she is so controlled by like her idea that there has to be a structure right yep. And so, you know, for her, it becomes like a fight against rather than let's find a way around, right? And I think it makes sense in her case because she did find a way around and then it was stolen. Right. Right. And so for her, it's like, okay, well, anything I do is just going to be um, compromised, right? Or, or taken. But part of it is because she comes from that structure business world where you do something and then you want the patent on it, the credit for it. The, the financial benefits of it and whatever. And to get into the most creative, crafty human space ever, you have to consider the possibility of not having those things. Yep. You have to consider the possibility of creating just for the sake of creating and figuring something out and sharing it with people and let them do what they were going to do with it and whatnot. Like that's the safest way to put out, um, you know, paradigm breaking technologies. Yep. And this goes for financial ones, energetic ones, all that kind of stuff. So I think that that is, you know, a lot of these people who, you know, 
are showing this fear or something digital or organic, or digital or not, quote unquote, not organic. And the, the truth of the matter is we don't even, we're not even 100% sure that we are, right? right. We the technology of just the previous version of the simulation. And so we feel, we seem more, or I think one of the things is each, each new generation becomes more mechanized and looks more like machinery as right and so that leads one to believe that the thing prior to that was real and this is something that is manufactured when it's just that we, we may be an earlier form of technology and it looks different yeah. right so or a different kind of technology or technology from a different place so you know we don't know but a lot of people who who seem to be really anti this evol evolution have not become efficient or even experimented with accepting both things but separating them on a certain level and most a lot of them are not in good physical health or good mental health or have a balanced life with uh you know social work time spent online time spent offline um i think that there's a good amount of um, possible. I think it's really possible that a solution to a lot of this is like really separating the space in which you engage in the technological environment from where you engage in the, engage in the quote unquote natural or organic environment from right. where you, you know, like not having all your technology going in the space where you live all the time, right? You have, go to some space to use technology, you know, and you go to some space to get away from technology. And then there's an area sort of in between where there couldn't be a little bit of, you know, integration or flow between but this space is for this this space is for that so that there is space for everything so that when you need to unplug you can yeah. and, and when you have to engage you can understand that you're making the choice to consciously fully engage and then when you're in the in-between space you understand that this is actually where new ideas come this is where it can be interesting is you know how many ways can we um make technology that we like that has that organic bent to it that has that mm -hmm. in, in, intuitive without feeling surveilled kind of uh, feel to it right and so i think it's just like really being clear and definite with creating spaces you know what i mean and then and then achieving balance within ourselves and how we deal with these things like i don't have a lot of compassion at this point for people who live online and then are in fear all the time Right. As soon as you close your computer and your television, nothing is scary. Right. Unless right. there's a bear. You know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. No. Um, in one of Sonia's workshop recently, uh, I said something that triggered somebody else. And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember when I was past life journeying. So, quote, past life journeying. Um, I was a robot. I was a sentient robot. So I started asking some other friends like, hey, you know, can you go forward in time or reverse in time as I did myself? Have I been a, a sentient robot? Yep, I got a yes. And I got a little peek of it. So who, who, you know, I just, I look at all these data sources that are like, um, the, the judgments that are being projected out of technology, who's to say they understand what a spirit and soul actually is and what vehicles get them. Mm -hmm. um, so I brought up when I was in Australia, we surrogated the spirit of a tree and the tree saw a murder and by that surrogation, there was enough data to, to detail who the murderer was, and there, that was enough to get a conviction from a tree. You can, you know, here we've done this with rocks. Uh, we've surrogated the, the soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, that aspect of rocks uh, down by Mount Chasta. And it was so traumatized by thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of a glacier on top of it, it just was freaked out. So, you know, we expressed that trauma and it was fine. So in my world, I understand that everything's alive. And 
instead of creating fear of this, it seems to me there could be a better, um, a better integration of like, wait a minute, this is just a game. And if you could, if you're playing, creating a game or playing the game, if you had that perspective of, look, everything's possible. And if you're just centered on defending a narrative of, uh, it's kind of a limitation, um, that's a whole lot of energy you're expressing to create that reality, first of all. And I guess I'm just expressing that I'm looking at it at, at a, in the amusement of it all at this point. Um, so a couple things. What do you say to the people who say, uh, we shouldn't listen to someone who's talking about this, who just acknowledged that they at one time were a sentient robot? Right. Because I know that one's going to come. Like, you know, he just admitted he's a sentient robot, right? right. And so, yeah. of course, he's going to, right? So, let's address that. Yeah. Um, I guess in my reality, I give no fucks about judgments or projections <laughs> towards me, right? Right. Um, because I would just reflect them back. And it, in my reality, I just don't have that negativity anymore. Um, did, you, did you ever? Because I think sometimes... And I'm gonna, this will go into the next question I'm going to ask you too. But I think because you are such a happy, positive guy that some people think that maybe you can't understand uh, where they're at or that they're struggling or where they're coming from. So do you want to right. maybe express like that that isn't necessarily the truth for you and, and, and how you got to this space? No, I, and I guess I would, the analogy would be the movie Lucy, where she, she t consumes that blue drug and she goes through this, the, the phases of, she, it seems like she's losing her humanity, her emotions, but she's actually just understanding the game at different awareness levels. Not that she's lost her humanity. Um, it, and it's unfortunate that she's so serious in that movie, right, too. She never smiles or laughs after she's gaining this awareness, which is just Hollywood in general, I think. Um, but um, I guess that's just the analogy that I find things amusing at this point. I've, I've done a lot of internal work that um, those receptors to judgments that he doesn't get it, or um, I just don't have those receptors anymore. It, I don't think it would really matter to me. So that, I get that. But the question, just address the one part of the question. Have you had struggles in your life? Oh, absolutely. Were you always this happy, positive, you know, kind of free flowing, happy, go lucky, go where the day takes me kind of guy? Okay, to answer that, in a period of two weeks, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, young adult, in the first 20s, I declared bankruptcy, got a, rolled my Jeep through the Caldecott Tunnel in the Bay Area, and got a DUI, and broke up after a five-year relationship. And... I just dusted myself off and went, oh, okay, lessons learned. I won't do that that way again, but I was motoring on. Um, Did you, so have you, have you ever gone through a deep period of frustration or depression or, or have you always just had this kind of thing that like, you know, the party must go on? Yeah. I've pretty much always been that way. Now, okay. I have worked on why some of that was shut off, the emotions mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. uh, over the past few years in, in my journey. And, and just you know, for the record, folks, I have seen Jeff cry. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like in, in that Vipassana, there was, a, there was a good three hours of letting stuff go. Um, so it's not... 
does that answer your question? I, uh, of yeah. course, I'm, I've had those experiences, but for whatever reason, this lifetime is, is more centered around looking at the maybe more uh, the amusement of the game or the whole puzzle of the game um and not not being so reactionary to mm -hmm. defending a narrative of yeah. the game yeah. so i think so you know i think it's interesting like for me i started off my life in that space of you know lots of things were wrong and that was the truth lots of things were wrong depression negativity all that kind of stuff and for me it's uh, only in the last couple of years that i'm at that space where i view things very similar to the way you do now mm -hmm. and uh, for me i'm not as involved technologically as you are so it, you know it's just like i feel like something clicked and i got it and oh. i realized you know that like whether i um sit in that negativity and depression and upset or I lead from a place of fun and joy, the same things are basically happening. Mm -hmm. And in one scenario, I'm miserable. And in the other scenario, I'm happy. That doesn't mean I don't have moments, hours, or days sometimes of not being happy, but they don't generally last longer than that. And um, sitting in them for a long time doesn't make them more real, mm -hmm. right? I've just shortened the amount of time that it takes from for, for when something happens to when I take action on it, instead of sort of sitting in that limbo space for so long, yeah. you know? So, and then I wanted to ask also, just because some people might say that you're able to take this um, line of thinking and reasoning and thought and attitude towards this all because technology has made you very successful. Technology mm -hmm. has offered you freedom, right? You've had success with cryptos, you've had success in the technology business. Um, and so, um, and I'm going to say this, and if this is not something you want shared, we can clip it out, <laughs> yeah. right? But yeah. I think that most people don't know that you've lost as much money as you've made at times in the crypto market. Yep. And you had, a, during our course of our friendship, you had a significant, uh, a point where you see, lost a significant amount of money. And um, I, you wouldn't, I would not have known had you not told me from the way you behaved. I right. be because yeah. my lifestyle is very, very simple. It's very clean. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm very grounded that way because I know my intent in this journey is to figure out the puzzle to this game. Right. I am not, you know, going to... Uh, do the whole well i might get a lamborghini at some point but <laughs> um but i'm not i'm not after the money monster aspect of it as we've talked about um mm -hmm. now uh, we've kind of <sighs> talked about a base layer of, of viewpoints of technology um but the, I think this is, I want to get to point out that the reason why this is getting brought up is because the base level systems that we all interact with, even the, the quote NPCs have got some inkling that the financial system, the religious system, the medical system, the, the news propaganda systems, um, they're all corrupt and insecure. And it's, it's created um, this irresponsibility for using social media, for example. Um, these keyboard warrior troll, all of this negative energy is a is a byproduct of our insecure technology systems. And the reason why I got into Bitcoin is because I. I had a gut feeling that this was going to reset that base layer to something that was responsible and, and, you know, had a ledger that was rebalanced in some sort of way. I didn't know at that time. Um, but then I, 
started hanging around or listening to DeSantis and his crew, and I really started to get it in the in this past few months that um, if you have an imbalance of our society at those core system levels, because they're all based on technology at this point, and technology itself is in is corrupted. Now, in hindsight, I do see why you and Danny Katz and and Randy were like looking at Bitcoin, going no. At first, I totally you you had that you know, already internal sense that, oh, something's wrong here. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm going to communicate why I think that was. So Bitcoin was created in 2009 <clears throat> and soldiered on. And then in 2012, 13, this company called Blockstream or Digital Currency Group came along, which is the central bankers, and corrupted it in ways that I could detail for hours at this point, but that's, that's not necessary. And then, you know, I'm not taking credit for this because it's really the Bitcoin life form or entity that made changes to itself. I just, I think I assisted that. I mean, a lot of times in this metaphysical faith space, we, we just make shit up and it comes true. And I'm just communicating in, in, September 18th of eight, 2018, uh, we gave it a go. And I didn't know that two months later, Bitcoin forked itself into Bitcoin SV. So it literally... What is SV? Satoshi's vision. Oh, okay. So it returned to its Genesis code, version point one. Um, and there's, there's a whole thing going on right now that Satoshi Nakamoto, when we surrogated the Bitcoin life form, we just surrogated the creators and participants. So there was a whole bunch of them involved in this creation. Didn't really get faces or names at that time because we were, we were pinpointing that. But now Craig Wright, Satoshi Nakamoto, has really come out in public and saying, well, I did create the bulk of this, and this is my original intent, and this is the blockchain that uh, I forked in November of 18. And so for those that uh, intuitively didn't like Bitcoin, I totally get why now because it was corrupted. But in November of 18, it got replay attacked and it's now uncorrupted in, in my, my reality, in my perception. And these crypto kids, DeSantis kids, this crew, are building things that are just astounding that one just got released today, you know, following DeSantis's tweets and him forking Twitter. The new Twitter is called Twetch, T-W-E-T-C-H. And it literally is built on the Bitcoin SV blockchain so that every tweet, you have to pay, you know, a penny to tweet. And if you like somebody's tweet, you have to pay them a quarter or 10 cents. So literally, <laughs> Nobody's going to be liking tweets. <laughs> Everyone's well, going to read them and not like them. <laughs> yeah. It's going to turn trolls into poets. Yes. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really important point. Like that, if, if trolls have to, if they can say what they want, but they, it comes at a cost, yep. right? Right away. I mean, it's the same thing with like, I get annoyed at work. We get all these like phone calls from, usually it's like a city name, but there's never anybody there. The phone just rings. I answer the phone. There's nothing there. And I'm of the opinion that like, if someone is going to call you who is not your personal contact, right, then, you know, they should have to pay you a quarter or something to make that call. That way they really think about whether they want to waste time calling you. Yep. Same thing with the trolling. So that's brilliant actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Either Urban or Randy, I can't remember, did a tweet 
these are the creators of this. Um, and, and there's a group of them and I not doing, you know, them justice by just calling them the DeSantis kids or crew, but that's what I know them by. And, and the last little tweet was a paid society is a polite society. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm seeing is mm -hmm. this Bitcoin SV is a new base layer that's going to, it's going to change everything in ways. You have to pay a little bit to say it, but you can say whatever you want. Want. And it will forever <sighs> be on the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm. Forever. There's no censoring. Um, so this is going to, to my perception, balance the imbalance of where we've gotten of this corrupt and insecure technology. Um, you know, it's pick your reality. Is, is AI just going to take over and control or can you use AI and technology to balance what has been the wild, wild west of technology? Well, and then there's the other part, of course, that like if AI is anything like some of the evil bastards that create it, it feeds off of people's fear of it. So, right, like that may make it stronger. So the in that case, the uh, appropriate thing to do is almost have a, you know, who cares attitude about, about AI, not be unwise about it, right? But it is here, like obviously, like just like a lot of other things that are happening, it doesn't really seem like pushback is going to stop it. Right. So adjust your attitude about it, decide where it fits in your life and carry on, right? And, you know, some people are going to say that that's awfully simplistic thinking, Emily, or that's da -da -da, whatever. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that like people who don't know that AI exists aren't afraid of it. Right. Right. Like, they're, like they're the furthest concern from like the tribes in the Amazon that have never been exposed to society or culture, right? Like it, they don't know about AI. It doesn't affect them. Yep. Right? So that's an extreme case of it for, you know, but there is truth to it only exists to the level that you engage with it. This came up with something, a totally different topic, but what Sonia and I were talking about in the last show. Okay. It hasn't, so, hasn't come out yet, but it will be out by the time this is out. Yep. So I, I'm just going to tell my 5G story. Yeah. Talking about technology and what you allow. So I went to farmer's market a couple, few weeks ago. And I saw this lady carrying around a table and she finally landed in a spot in outside of the farmer's market. And I did my shopping and I came back out and she approached the table and she said, do you know anything about 5G? And I go, well, yeah, I know quite a bit. I'm watching these kids in Austin, Texas go around with their little uh, smog meters and figuring out where this 5G signal is, is harmful or not. And, it's just really interesting that if you're behind trees, the 5G cannot penetrate the trees. So um, uh, I continued for a little bit and she goes, what do you mean? One of these meters? And I didn't even see it when I walked up, but she had the, the small 5G meter on the table. And I go, oh yeah, that thing. And she had this grin like, okay, I'm going to show you how toxic 5G is. And she picks it up. And the meter, she says, anything over 10,000 on this meter is, is very detrimental. And I just, I figured out that why she picked that spot to put her table is because she was roaming around Farmer's Market to find the toxic spot to show everybody. So she's looking at me, waiting for my reaction, and the meter turns on and it literally goes to 100 and just flat lines and right then right in that moment i knew <laughs> that it, that you that that because you're not afraid of 5g yep. it barely exists this it's not 5G. that it doesn't it's not that it doesn't but it's almost like the fear is a beacon for it to flare up so yep. when it, just like when sharks smell blood yep yeah yep. I, and, and if you ask my opinion i think sharks are a an ai or like a patrol technology of an earlier form of the simulation Mm. right like the way that they are compared to whales right like whales would seem more organic sharks more digital right yeah. the way that they censor the way that they have like the things that are like sensors and stuff like that like there's just something to me that's like very 
mm, swarm hive minds the AIE Borgish about sharks that aren't, isn't so much about uh, a whale or a dolphin or something like that, right? Yeah. So it's very interesting. That that is super, super interesting. I mean, like I know for myself, like once I stopped. I mean, and people. I know this upsets some people and whatever, but like once I stopped caring about some of these things, then the effects I started stop feeling them as much. It's not yep. that you never ever. I mean, we're, no one here is denying that these things exist. Everything exists. Yeah everything exists and um but you know sometimes just the fear created around some of them accomplishes the task that the technology actually isn't able to accomplish yep and so keep that in mind when we choose how to react to all that stuff including ai including to cryptocurrencies and whatnot like nobody is telling anybody to go you know put put all of your life savings into cryptocurrencies or whatever right. But rather than sit in fear and, you know, if, you, if, it's not, if it's not for you, it's not for you. And that's totally fine. Like, I have no problem with that. But rather yeah. than sit in fear and judgment and whatnot about people who are into it or whatever, you know, take $100 and play around. Yeah. And see, maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you'll decide it's not for you, but you'll realize that, oh, it's actually like nothing is actually really happening. It's just the same as all the other financial bullshit. And that's a fine thing to come away from. Or you may say, oh, this is really interesting the way it works. I don't care about it for money, but this might be interesting for technologies like Twitter or whatever. Or you may get lucky. You may make a million dollars and then suddenly you'll be saying Bitcoin's the greatest thing in the world. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, yeah. so uh, even, even the... The partner of mine that surrogated the Bitcoin entity back in August really wasn't tracking Bitcoin. And we had a, a phone call a few days ago and he's, you know, they're like, hey, man, I'm getting all these clients asking me about Bitcoin and it's in my field. I, I don't know what's going on here. And I go, well, this isn't just a currency. This just everybody's looking at Facebook coin right now as as a global currency. And that's not what Bitcoin SV is going to do. It's going to replace YouTube and Google. Remember back when we were talking about uh, DeSantis tweets and he said, okay, successfully um, compressed one, a one terabyte file down to 0. 0.0001 megabyte. I screenshot the fuck out of that because energetically I was – I didn't know at the time, but this is what Bitcoin SV is going to do in some manner. I, I don't know technically how, but say this video, um, say it's, it's 300 megabytes when you download it. You're going to, instead of putting it on the, the corrupted and it, everybody's calling it the Bitcoin core blockchain, the corrupted one that's limited uh, what is it limited to? Oh, I'm going to make up a number because I just don't care. A hundred megabyte or no? What is it? A hundred K per block? I don't even know. I don't know. It's so ridiculously dumb. Oh, three. They want to, it's one megabyte. They want to limit it down to 300 kilobytes. So it's literally just a blockchain of monetary transactions that's all it can do that's why it hasn't been able to scale that's it's just a mess bitcoin sv is going to go to terabyte blocks so my example is you can upload this video and for the rest of time if anybody wants to watch this video and they throw their 12 cents or 25 cents to view it it will, that income will always go to you mm. forever. And there only has to be one copy of this uploaded. How many copies in I, of iTunes, you know, yeah. Cindy, Cindy Lauper songs are out there on the internet because everybody's right. copied them so many times. Yeah. It's ridiculous waste of storage. Um, so content creators, musicians, videos, podcasters, writers, uh, you know, Danny Katz publishes a document and whoever wants to read that pays their penny in perpetuity. Yeah. It, and it can never get taken down. Ever. Yeah. 
so this is the thing that I, I didn't understand at the time, but why I got into cryptos, because I knew the base layer of reality of technology was off, and this was somehow going to balance it. And, and there's many threads to pull on that, but just by the kids launching Twitch today, um, it's a proof of concept where, yeah, I <laughs> spent 25 cents to like a tweet, a Twitch. They're gonna, have, I don't know, how, that's gonna be weird to get used to. Um, and in kindness, the, the fella just money buttoned me back that 25 cents because they're, you know, it's in beta right now. But um, it, that is a polite society. It is a polite society. Mm -hmm. And um, the other point is, I mean, that, you could actually get to a space where you could just make money off of the people that don't like you. Correct. Right? You could actually allow the people who are your fans, followers, admirers, appreciators, uh, co-creators to enjoy your information for free and just allow the assholes, the critics and whatever to uh, pay your salary. If you, if you actually were creating really interesting content that was both um, important and controversial, you could, you know, you could make sure that any, you know, the people who really wanted to engage with it in a positive way had access to it for free by doing something like that, right? They're willing to pay, so that's great, but you're willing to give it back to them because they left a comment that was helpful or encour encouraging or engaging or whatever. And then the people who want to be assholes are entitled to be assholes and you're never going to tell them to shut up or try and censor them, but they can pay salary. <laughs> yep. I like it. Yep. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, and I mean, this goes to the attention based society that it, everything seems to be headed towards, um, which is a, a whole conversation I'm sure many data sources and podcasters can go into. Um, but I just see this as a rebalancing of a base layer of technology. Um, because this is going to so, strange loop, so to speak, right back onto the government or corporations. Once you get onto a, a ledger that of this nature, they're not going to be able to steal the twenty-one trillion dollars out of budgets anymore. Um, right. Everything's going to be accountable, or and they're so, going to have to keep their. The, the places where they interact so separate that everyone will know, oh yeah, that's where the corrupt people go to steal $21 trillion. So it's like, after, you know, the idiots who kept their shit in Bank of America or, you know, with Lehman Brothers or whatever after the crash, or that's, that's a dumb. Yeah. 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 Um, so there's, uh, just to finish this, this <laughs> Bitcoin SV rant, I mean, I mostly got into Bitcoin when it was a hundred dollars. And right now, Bitcoin SV is two hundred dollars. I see a flippening happening in that I think Bitcoin core, Bitcoin Cash, and Bitcoin SV will probably always exist. But once everybody starts understanding where this is going. And it could be shortly, um, you know, Bitcoin SV is going to be the one worth $9,000 and Bitcoin Core is going to be worth $100. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could, you know, if you have that gift of just internally uh, sensing the data that I'm communicating, it, this is your opportunity to do what I did in 2013. Um, because your, your invest, your, your paying attention to a, a rebalancing of the base layer of technology. And, and there's so many different p parts and pieces that you could talk about, but, um, I'm just expressing, I see where this is going. Uh, and this is, it's a replay attack that actually happened that manifested in the collective, so to speak. And here we are. Um, so I'm 
almost sweating. I'm so excited just <laughs> to, to be in this little group of, of creators that reprogrammed reality, so to speak, to, to re-anchor the base layer of technology in ways that um, the original intent that I saw back in 2013 is actually happening. So instead of being- say, Sorry, what do you say to people that say that other people don't have the right to reprogram reality? Right, that that's not like, you know, like, uh, you know, cause somebody's gonna say, well, what right do they have to reprogram reality? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's even, we were tossing around, or I was, the group intent that just change your reality and if enough of us do it, it expands out to the collective. Um, that shit just happens and you know, whether we like it or not, there are people who are doing what they think is reprogramming of reality. So this comes to where, uh, you know, Sonia says there are no laws. So there's right. no laws for them and there's no laws for you. So they're, they think they're doing it. You go ahead and do what your version of reprogramming reality is too. Yep. Do it from your space. Don't do it with the intent of changing something, you know, don't do it out of vengeance, you know, like trying to screw somebody over or this, that, right. or the other thing that doesn't work. That like, I think that is inappropriate, but yeah, like, if we are living in a computer programmed reality, it can be reprogrammed yep. and, so, you know, but do, do it as reprogramming your reality, not with the intent of reprogramming it for everybody else. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, so we're getting to, I'm getting, I have a limited battery situation where I'm at. So uh, if, if there's anything else you want to get out in this first part, then let's do that. If not, let's take a quick potty break and, um, and move into the patrons hour. Do you have anything else you want to get out right now? Um, nope, that, that's, that's pretty good. All right, so why don't you let people know what your Twitter handle is? Because you've been doing a lot of interaction on Twitter and what your Twitch handle is and how people can get involved in that if that's, if that's available yet. Yep, in the limited social media, I, I'm just on Twitter to follow these kids, these creators, these reprogrammers. Um, so my social media, whatever, uh, interaction is very very clean and simple, but it's Jeff W. Gates on YouTube and Twitter. Um, on YouTube, I created playlists of some of the stuff I'm following and you can- And original videos to come. And yes, yep. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, those of you who uh, are patrons, you can join us over in the second hour. We, this concludes the metaphysics of the blockchain segment. In the next, in the patrons hour, we'll talk about the metaphysics of everything else. If you are not yet a patron, please join us at Off Planet Media. Uh, sorry, patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media. And we will see you on the other side. Listening to Off Planet Radio at OffPlanetRadio.com.